Mark chapter 6. It's a very, very familiar passage of Scripture we're going to read this morning. <clears throat> and uh, it's one of those passages of Scripture that gets so familiar that sometimes we just read it. And we know the details, but we don't really know them. And uh, it's a story that I know we have talked about it in the past. But my thinking about the passage is changing. And it's changing perhaps even as I stand here with you this morning. Mark chapter 6, verse 45 through 52. When the disciples are on the sea and the wind is blowing against them and they're straining at the oars. We have this passage of Scripture and we talk about it very often. We say, yep, Jesus walks on the water. He calms the storm. He cures their fears. And they make it to the other side. Good, check, and we move along. And I guess all that is in there. But so often as we read this story, I think that our emphasis is in the wrong place. Our emphasis in the very place where the disciples' emphasis was that day. And uh, I think as we talk this morning, at least I hope as we talk this morning, you will see that we need to move our focus off of the things that we generally focus on and reset it someplace else. And that would be upon Jesus. Verse 45, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out, <clears throat> excuse me, they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Although, as I said, most of us have probably heard this story in the past time and time again. I know I have told this story in the past. I have had words written down in my notes that I will say to you this morning. But I want you to know, as I was looking at those words and the Word of God over the last few days, I realized that oftentimes my reading of the story and my telling of the story put the emphasis in the wrong place. And I think oftentimes that translates into us living our lives with the emphasis in the wrong place. The disciples had been straining at the oars or fighting a headwind, and they just were not making any headway. Have you ever felt like that in your life? Have you ever felt like you had a place that you needed to go and you just couldn't get there? That the wind was blowing against you and the seas were your boat, and the harder you struggled to move forward, the more it seemed like you stayed in the same place or lost ground. Now, I am pretty sure that most of us, if not any of us, have ever been on this Sea of Galilee in the midst of a terrible headwind, making no progress. But it draws a parallel for our lives. Just as we identify with understanding there are winds that come against us in life that prevent us from moving forward and often steal our focus. And no matter how much effort we put into driving ourselves against that headwind, we just never make any headway. They were living it out in real time. It was a parallel to something that was happening spiritually in their lives. And I'm afraid it's a parallel to something that happens far too often in our lives. But I want you to know this morning that when the wind blows against your life, when the tempest rages, set your eyes on Jesus, not upon the wind, not upon the storm. They struggle and they struggle in the darkness of night. And then in the midst of the darkness, 
something comes walking on the water to them. And in the midst of every attention being on getting that boat across the sea to the other side, they begin to focus on this figure coming out of the darkness and out of the mist. And what is the only thing that they're able to understand that this thing could possibly be? They believe it to be a ghost. And you know, we often say that these were fishermen and they were on the sea. And what a terrible storm this must have been because they were terrified by the storm that was battling their boat. But as I was reading the, sto the story, I recognized that though they were probably concerned about the conditions of the sea, it doesn't mention that they were afraid or fearful until they saw the figure appear and start walking out amongst the waves and the wind. They looked out and they saw this figure in the distance coming closer and closer to them. And they don't recognize who it is. Why? They're so busy about the wind and the waves and getting to their point B that they can't recognize Jesus walking in the midst of their storm. They're so busy wondering what is that in the mist that they're looking at Jesus and they can't recognize that Jesus is walking towards them. And as Jesus approaches the boat, in fact, I don't believe it was ever Jesus' intention to stop. So he was passing them by and they saw him and then he stopped. And he recognized that they were afraid. And he probably said, Meshuggah to these guys, they still don't learn. <laughs> Actually, before he left. But as he approaches them, he says, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. And then they recognized this figure that was coming out of the darkness of night upon the waves and amidst the wind as none other than Jesus himself. Now you might be wondering, because I was wondering, how in the world did they not recognize Jesus before he spoke to them? They knew who he was. They had been with him. They had been sitting for his teachings. They had seen some miracles. Yet in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of making no headway on the way to point B, in the midst of that kind of battle, in the midst of needing Jesus, in the midst of should have understanding that Jesus, though physically wasn't with them in the moment, his spirit and his power and the love and the might of the living God was there with them. In the midst of all of that, when Jesus is beginning to show up on the scene physically, they still don't recognize him. Why? Because they were so busy trying to handle the situation and the circumstances. They were so busy straining at the oars against the wind. They were so busy being afraid of what it was that was approaching them that they could not recognize Jesus in the midst. I sometimes feel like the church is like that. The church gets so busy straining at the oars, trying to come up with new and unique ways to move forward to point B, that Jesus comes walking by and we think, oh, we don't want anything to do with that. It might be a ghost. And we even fear Jesus. Oh, that we would shut up long enough and slow down enough to stop and hear Jesus say, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. I don't know what kind of experience you have or haven't had with the Lord. But I know that around here we have seen some pretty miraculous things that God has done on our behalf. We have seen the work and the move of the Holy Spirit. We have experienced the healing touch of the living God. We have experienced the sustaining power of God in our midst. And yet so often we strain at the oars thinking there's a point B that we have to get to. So often we focus on the storm around us, the wind and the waves. Like I said, I don't know how concerned the disciples truly were about the storm. I know they had to say, man, this is a bad headwind. But they were used to being on the water. They were used to fighting in those kind of conditions. Because if they didn't fish, they didn't live. Have you ever seen Delius Catch? The crab fisherman? in the Baltic Sea, out there in the midst of the winter. Terrible. The boat covering in ice in the dark of night in the midst of hurricane force winds, snow coming down, 
20 foot waves washing over the bow, bringing everything across the deck. They're out there because they're fishermen. You and I, we would have been in the, in the galley throwing up from seasickness. They're out there working 12, 18, 24, 36 hour shifts at a time. Get three minutes rest. And say, we found crab. Let's go back to it. These were guys that were used to being on the water. I don't know if they were fearful of the conditions or not. It doesn't say they were. But when they did not understand who it was that was approaching them, they began to fear. Normally you say, you have fears in your life. Jesus is walking on the water. I don't want to take that away from you, but I'm not sure if this is exactly the picture that's in this passage this morning. I want you to know, when our eyes are focused on the stuff of life around us, we miss Jesus showing up on the scene, and we begin to be afraid of who God is. We begin to miss who God is. Oh, we begin to struggle in our own efforts to find safety and to find security and to move ourselves forward. So often when things get hard or tough or stagnant in life, it's not because there is no power to get us moving forward. It's because we are trusting in our own self-efforts. We're trusting in the schemes of men to make our lives come under control. We struggle at the oars against the headwinds of life, and we get nowhere. We just get consumed, so much so that we forget that we have seen and experienced the power of the living God. We forget that we are called by His name, that we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand, and it is promised unto us a yes and amen. Oh, that there is nothing that we lack. There is no good thing that we lack in this life when we have Jesus. If we allow this to continue on long enough, we get to the point that we stop recognizing our help. And we see Jesus in the midst of the storm coming towards us. And we don't even know that our help is drawing nigh. The amazing thing is that the very thing that we struggle against with so much might and so much effort to overcome, the very obstacle or storm that comes our way, that we think we're battling for control, Jesus has already totally and completely dominated it. We just don't know how we're going to bear up under it. We just don't know how we're going to get through it, but we're just still stroking on those oars. All of our might to move ourselves a little bit forward. But he's already got the victory. And it is so often the very thing that Jesus uses as a means to come to us in the midst of our self-effort and doubt, in the midst of us thinking that we've got it all together or that we can actually get it all together. Jesus walks upon those trials and those winds and those seas so that he could get to us at the very point where we were missing the object lesson that Jesus is with us and that we can trust him. He demonstrated his control over their situation by walking on the water in the midst of the storm and then by calming the storm when he gets into the boat. Oh, what a mighty, mighty, mighty God we serve. There's a reason when we shout and sing Jesus that we feel and we experience something. There are times when life appears out of control, but Jesus is always in control. There are times when it seems like there's nobody in charge, but I want you to know Jesus firmly seated upon the, uh, the, the throne of the universe. And if you and I will allow upon the throne of our hearts, we will not be moved. You see, Jesus is never tossed to and fro by the winds of life. He still walks amidst the waves and the wind of your life. And he has the power to bring you through. I'm sure that you've learned that some storms are just part of this fallen world that we live in. Some people will tell you you'll never have a trouble or trial once you come to Jesus. Some people will tell you you'll never have to walk through anything ever again. That you'll just be floating around on cloud nine playing a harp with a halo. Some of you know that that may not exactly be the truth. 
Sometimes the winds that come against us are the predictable outcome of really stupid decisions on our part. But that's a different thing than what we're talking about today. Sometimes the, the storms of life just come because you and I are called by the name of Jesus. We are called by the name of Jesus. And this world and hell itself is against us. We do not belong to it. So we are always walking against the current. We are always walking against the culture. We are always walking against the norms. We are always going a different way than everything and everyone else in this world is. You see, our eyes are set upon the author and the finisher of our faith. Our eyes are set on the mountain of God and we are moving towards His purposes for our life and everything else is streaming against us. You know, hell itself wants to take you out. And if we take our eyes off of Jesus, and instead of making progress against the culture, against the stream, against the wind of the day in which we live, we'll find ourselves spiritually straining at the oars, saying, well, I'm saying all the right things. I'm confessing all the right things. I'm proclaiming all the right things. But nothing's happening. Nothing's going on. I want you to know Jesus isn't just worried about what you can confess and about what you can proclaim, but Jesus is concerned that you know him and that I know him deeply and intimately. You see, it's from that knowledge of who Jesus is and understanding that he walks in life with us that in the midst of the blowing of wind that is trying to impede your work for the kingdom. It is in knowing him that gives power to our words, that gives power to our confessions, that gives power to our declarations. So often people want to tell you, just say this or just do that. No, just know Jesus. You see, we all want something to do, but we need to know Jesus. See, we strain at the oars trying to do the religious thing. I want you to know that your finances won't save you. The political leaders won't save you. Your church denomination will not save you. Knowing Jesus will save you. Knowing Jesus will move your life forward. Getting your eyes off all the stuff that you can control with your own self-effort. That will give you abundance in life. That will give you power to stand when all else fails. That will give you authority to move against the current of the day in which you live. You see, God in his might and his power and his majesty, he is your protector and He is your provider. There is no good thing that you or I or any man, woman, or child can ever do apart from God. It doesn't matter how religious. It doesn't matter how sanctimonious. It doesn't matter how many people we can get to agree with us. The power comes from knowing Jesus. We will always be afraid in the midst of the storm if we do not know Jesus. He may be walking on by but we will not recognize him. We must know Jesus. Our focus must be set on Jesus. Men will discourage you. Men will disappoint you. Men will come up short. Men will fail. But Jesus is always more than enough. You can never run dry on Jesus. When you are in the midst of a storm, it can be hard to see that every storm has an end. The storm, the wind, begins to take on a life of its own in our minds. And we begin to play out a movie of things that are going to happen to us and how bad it could be. But I want you to know, every storm comes to an end. A few years back, we had a hurricane come through. It wasn't a particularly big hurricane as far as category winds go. Just a one. But it was a tremendous, tremendously long storm. And it kept drawing more and more moisture up from the coast. And it flooded the whole area. Towns were wiped away in water. Places flooded down the mountain, in the valleys that had never seen in their lifetime. But you know what happened? The storm passed. It came to an end. But in the midst of that storm, it seemed like it's going on and on and on and on. 
And the longer it went on, the more our attention got focused on that storm. And the more that sto- our attention was focused on the storm, the more we were sure it would continue on forever. But I want you to know this morning, every trial that comes your way, every assault of the enemy that comes your way, every wind of the contrary things of this world that blows against your headway in God, it has an end date. It is not eternal. It is not almighty. It is not all powerful. It doesn't have to wipe you out. It doesn't have to hold you back. God wants you to be impelled forward. Every storm has an end. In this particular story, that storm ended when Jesus climbed in the boat. The wind subsided. John says, and suddenly they were on the other side. But I want you to know this. Some storms in life may be a little bit longer, some a little bit shorter. Some headwinds may blow a little bit harder, some a little bit less. But they all have an expiration date. But your Jesus does not. He always endures. Oh, and he is walking in the midst of your troubles and your trials to get to the place where you are. And they want to know something? It's not even so much that he needs to get there. See, he's already there in the midst with us. Sometimes we need a little reminder, but we should remember Jesus is with us. I'm thankful for the times that Jesus gets in the boat and just stops the winds. But I long for the days when I prevail in such faith that even if hell itself should breathe a strong headwind against me, and I have to struggle with the oars in obedience to God's command, I will trust him to bring me to the other side. You see, that was the plan on this day. Jesus told the disciples, get in the boat, go on the other side, and I will meet you there. Jesus didn't say, get in the boat, and I'll walk on the water halfway and get in with you. Even when Jesus saw them struggling at the oars and decided it was time for him to leave, I believe his plan was still to walk on the waves to the other side and meet them on the shore. Why? Because they should have known that Jesus commanded them, get in the boat and go. And so they should have gotten in that boat and gone and nothing should have held them back. What if they had just trusted him through the wind? What if they had just believed that Jesus was there with them in spirit? What if they didn't need to be rescued that day, but they persevered in the spirit and continued against that headwind? Sometimes I wonder if we want our journey with the Lord to be so absent of any resistance that we fold at the first sign of a headwind. But one way or another, the winds will cease, but Jesus will remain. What are some of the strong headwinds that you face? Each one of us usually face different things in our lives. For some, paralyzing winds of fear. For others, sexual failure. For some, past hurts or discouragement or loneliness or financial hardship or poor health or great loss or death or old age or the loss of youthful good looks and flowing golden locks of hair. Whatever form it takes, We all have things that challenge our progress with the Lord. As I said, when Jesus came to the disciples walking upon the water, they feared him to be a ghost. Think of this. In the midst of this horrible storm and the winds that were impeding their progress, do you know what the first thought came to their minds? Literally, the boogeyman is here! (laughs) And we laugh at them. But you know what our response usually is, or often is, far too often, when the wind is blowing against us and we're not getting anywhere and Jesus begins to come out on the horizon, we say, oh no, the boogeyman is there for us. No, it is Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. We should have known he was there the whole time, but he is stepping in, in the midst of our brokenness. When he spoke to them, he addressed the very root of their fear. They didn't recognize Jesus for who he was. As I said, I don't believe that their fear was of the storm. They probably had a very healthy respect for their situation. They feared the ghost that was coming towards them. Their fear was based on the fact that they did not recognize Jesus. You know, our fear when we're facing the struggles and the trials of life, do you know where it comes from? Not recognizing Jesus. Oh, we just said when we sing, Jesus, 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 that there's power that's released. 
we find ourselves bound by the headwind of fear in whatever form it comes, always from the root of not recognizing who Jesus is. He comes walking in the midst of their circumstances. Give them a reason to believe that he is an ever-present help in their time of need. He identified himself to the disciples in verse 51. It is I. This is what the language geeks call an emphatic personal pronoun. It is a statement of identification. It is as if Jesus were saying, Hey guys, don't be afraid of what your ignorance you imagine that I am. Instead, know I am. Man, just think about that for a moment. He was saying, guys, don't fear what you think I am because you're ignorant. Instead, know I am. Man, that should stir something inside of us. That should stir something inside of us. Jesus declared, I am. It is I. He was proclaiming something about himself. Jesus was reminding the disciples, he's reminding us of who he is. When Moses asked, who should I say is sending me? The answer came back, I am. The personal name of the eternal, immortal, self-existent, all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing, King of kings and Lord of lords, God Almighty himself. He has proven his power time and time again since the dawning of time. Just remember his power as it was revealed in creation of the world in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Remember his perseverance of Noah in Genesis 6 through 7. Remember the miracle surrounding the deliverance of Israel from Egypt in Exodus 3 through 15. Over and over and over, God has proven that he has the power to exceed our wildest imaginations. And you want to know something? He hasn't changed. He is still God Almighty. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you have a mountain that needs moving, he is the only one qualified and able to get the job done. The kind of power we're talking about is illustrated in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12. Who hath measured the waters in the hollows of his hand and made out heaven with the span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a, ba- in a balance. This verse reminds that God is able to spread with his fingers and cover all the stars of the heavens. It also can mean to us that he placed them in orbit by just simply flicking his finger and the whole universe was cast out there. If he displays that kind of power in and for inanimate objects around us, just imagine what kind of power he would unleash on behalf of his sons and daughters. Just imagine the kind of power that he's willing to bring to bear in your life and your circumstances today. His very name, I am, describes him to be one who is ever-present. Being I am, he is always God all the time. There has never been a time when he did not exist, nor will there be a time when he is not. He is here present with you today, even against a prevailing wind. He promises that he is with you all the time in all places, through all the difficulties of life. When the Lord says that he will never leave you nor forsake you, the term literally means that he won't turn and run out on you when the going gets tough. You know the saying, don't you? When the going gets tough, the tough gets going. No! When the going gets tough, Remember, God never leaves you and he will never forsake you. You see how much better our sayings are than the world sayings? The world saying tells you, if you're going to make it in life and it's tough, you better get up and be tough and do it yourself. We set ourselves to look at that headwind and we strain in our own ability at the oars. We need a Holy Ghost impeller on the ship of our life. We need to be carried along by the very breath of our God. Oh, I want you to know that when the going gets tough, Jesus is still right there with you. He's going to move you forward. 
He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's not a fair-weather friend. He's an all-weather friend. In fact, the worst life tries to throw things at you, and the more the storm clouds roll in, and the heavier the rain comes down, and the bigger the flashes of lightning, I want you to know. It's just an opportunity to show how mighty our God is. It's just an opportunity for God to display his power over the natural realm. It is an opportunity for God to say in the midst of our lives, I am. Oh, when we see Jesus walking up on the horizon, we don't need to fear him. We should recognize him. We should see the great I am coming towards us. And our hearts should rejoice because he is our friend. He knows all things. When Job considered the knowledge of God, he said in Job 23.10, But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. What this means is that God is worthy of your trust because he knows exactly where you are and what you are facing. Second by second as you journey through this life, he hasn't missed a thing that has happened to you or is happening to you or will happen to you. He knows and he understands and he is able to help in your time of need. You can trust him. He sees your steps and he will get you through to the other side. He is the great I am. His name declares his character. He is Jehovah, the Lord who is our provider, our shepherd, our peace, our healer, our righteousness, our banner, our sanctifier. He is the Lord Most High, and He is the Lord God who is always there regardless of where we find ourselves or what may come our way. Simply rest in the fact that Jesus is I am. In the Gospel of John, we have the I am statements of Jesus. I am the bread of life, He said. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. And in John chapter 18, when the soldiers came to arrest him in the garden, he said in verse 5, I am. And there was a release of power. And the soldiers drew back and were knocked to the ground. That is the very power that we're talking about. When we speak the name of Jesus out of a faithful relationship, there is a release of power that knocks back the enemy, that drives away the imposing wind and causes us to move towards our goal and our purpose in Christ. When Jesus came to the disciples that night, they were a hot mess. They perhaps were thinking they're never going to get to the other side. If the storm doesn't break, then maybe we just might really be in some trouble. But Jesus had one more area to address in their life. He wanted them to know that, yes, as I said, this storm has an end, but they had a future. God wants you to know this morning, the storm that you're facing, it has an end, but you have a future. In verse 45, depending on the version that you're reading from, Jesus made or compelled them to get into the boat and go on to the other side. That means he was pushing or forcing them to get in that boat and to go on the other side. He knew exactly where they were. He knew exactly where he was sending them. He knew exactly what they would encounter along the way. He was completely responsible for where they were in that boat at that moment of time. And you want to know something? He had a plan for them. When they reached the other side, and Jesus came out to them in the water that night, they recognized him and allowed him in the boat, and he stilled the waters, and he got them to the other side. Why? Because he wanted them to know that there is a purpose for their lives. There is a purpose for your life. You might feel like you're stuck out in the middle of the lake today. You might feel like you're not making any headwind or that you're being pushed backwards. If you would set your eyes on Jesus, you'd recognize something very real. The storm has an expiration date. But Jesus is bringing you to his purpose for your life. Jesus is bringing you to a purpose of accomplishment for his kingdom in your life. You see, he knows 
the plans that he has for you. And they are good plans for you. And they are plans to bring your life to a good end. Not death out in the sea, but bring you to a good end. Where you step from this reality into the truest of realities. And he looks at you and he recognizes the banner over your life. And he says, enter into my rest, you good and faithful servant. You have done so well. When he spoke to them, his words, I believe, were words of correction as well as comfort and of hope. He spoke peace to their present and in doing so let them know that they had a future ahead of them. Take courage. Do not be afraid. Again, the language geeks, the phrase is present active imperative. Literally, stop fearing now and never fear anything else ever again. It's like saying, don't you know that I am, and I am always with you, and I am always going to be with you. Remember I said fear at its root was not recognizing Jesus is there with us. Long before they saw a ghost on the war, they should have known Jesus was there with them. Long before we get to the point of fearing the boogeyman coming out in the midst of our storms, we should know that Jesus is with us. We should not fear. In fact, he, he is giving us a very strong imperative action to follow, continue in our lives. Do not be afraid. Take courage. Grab your bootstraps in the spirit and pull up Holy Ghost stirrups so you stand tall and mighty in the power of the living God. Stop fearing now and never fear anything again. Recognize who I am. Often from a human perspective, life is tough and the future looks bleak and there may not seem like there's a lot of hope. Will we escape disease? Will family members survive the pressures of life? Will those that we love be okay? Will we have enough resources for the future? Will we ever make any headway against the wind or will we struggle at the oars and never get anywhere near the other side? In the midst of all that and more, Jesus is, always was, always will be, always is present right now. We talked about the word Hanani, and we applied it to men responding to the call of God, but we also saw that there was times when God said, Hanani, I am here present with you. Whatever is going on, I am in the moment. I'm cognizant of you. I understand. I see. I care. I am here. Why can we never fear again? Because we come to a religious, intellectual understanding? No. Because God wants to drop a revelation in our hearts that we understand in our spirits that God is here with us. That we have taken up a living quarters with him and he with us. That we can abide in him and he can abide in us. That we can remain his word and his words can remain in us. And they can wash and renew our minds so that our thought process is not natural but supernatural. So our eyes don't focus on the troubles of life and the winds of hell that blow against us. But our eyes look beyond the wind and beyond the horizon and see the mountain of God and know that Jesus is saying, I've got a place for you just over the hilltop. I prepared a place for you and I am working to bring you on to myself and nothing will ever Ever truly destroy you in this life but there is hope and there is power and there is life and there is victory for you regardless of where the road of life leads us God knows how to take care of his children and how to see us through he has a plan for your life you have a future and he can be trusted never count God out he will never leave you and he will always be at your side no matter what you face in life, he is always working for your good. Situations arise that you have no control over. There may be rough times ahead for the church and for God's people. There may be economic crisis. There may be political upheaval. But through it all, know that God is enough. He is all we will ever need to meet the needs that are real in life. One thing is truly needful. How willing are you to be satisfied with just Jesus? If this world withholds from you its silver and gold, 
and you have to get along on meager fare when you still trust in Jesus. If you can't have a $47 million private jet and you have to suffice with Jesus and a ticketing coach, will you still be satisfied? If you have to get along with just Jesus and you don't have the daily recommended requirements of food to eat, will you and I still be satisfied with just Jesus? You see, we add so many things on to the things that make our life full and abundant that we have no room for Jesus. And when the wind begins to blow against what we think is prosperity, we lose sight of who Jesus is. We forget what he looks like and we begin to fear his presence. But I want you to know this morning that God is calling us on to himself and he wants us to come to the place where we are satisfied every longing in knowing that he is king almighty and he inside of us and he has delivered us from the body of death and he has caused us to be more than conquerors and overcomers in this life by the blood of Jesus and some may be led to the palace to be a witness for Jesus some may be down on skid road being a witness for Jesus others will be in the midst but the important thing is this can we be satisfied whatever state in life with Jesus you see if we're not satisfied with Jesus we will fear life we will fear not having enough. And that would be our pursuit. And the church will find a way to wrap Jesus' name on it. But our pursuit will be the love of money. Our pursuit will be the next person. Our pursuit will be the next teaching. Our pursuit will be the next church. Our pursuit will be the next group of people. Our pursuit will be the next accomplishment. The next thing that people pat on the back and say, Oh, you did such good stuff. And you know what that will do? It will leave us in the middle of the lake straining at the oars of self-accomplishment and self-effort. And no matter how hard we struggle, we won't get to the other side where God has told us to go. We need to be satisfied with Jesus because he's more than enough. Now some people will tell you you should glory in poverty. No, you should glory in knowing Jesus. You should be satisfied whatever state in life you are at with Jesus. You see, because sometimes we go on the other side and we think if we make ourselves poor enough or we beat ourselves enough that somehow we'll be pitiful enough that we somehow become holy. No. Holiness doesn't come by any of our efforts, but by receiving the grace of God through Jesus Christ. We receive the righteousness of God. Oh, sinners become saints. Those in spirit become rich that it overflows and it just begins to contaminate a world that is putrid with the goodness of God can you get along with mega fair if you have Jesus can you be satisfied with just Jesus Can you not be distracted should you run into a blessing financially or politically or emotionally or socially? Can you be satisfied with Jesus rather than the stuff? Remember a long time ago when I was a kid, church was going to do a TV show. They had a lady in the congregation that was fairly wealthy. And she gave the money to buy all the TV equipment and I get the show up and running, but she had to be one of the first guests. And then the pastor had to go and, you know, witness to her husband and spend time with her husband so he could get saved. And I remember thinking, well, that just doesn't sound right. But then I watched the interview that they did with her. And she was talking about all the trappings of life and making this big thing about, I really don't need all of them. The furs and the money and the cars. You know, the trappings of life. And she talked like that, you know? You know how, like, some the stereotype of like snooty rich people is oh. <laughs> that was, that's what it was he's all oh, the trappings of life I don't need them but I praise God for them <laughs> that's almost as dumb as saying I can't fly an airplane because that's like being trapped in a tin can with a bunch of devils my God man you're an evangelist those are lost souls what better place to be trapped they can't get away from you Captive audience. Preach it, brother. 
Don't take an offering. Preach the gospel. Jesus has got to be enough for us. He has got to be enough spiritually, financially, physically, emotionally, and eternally. Can you be satisfied with just Jesus? He's enough. He's enough. He is more than enough. Oh, for the days when we sang, you can take this whole world. Just give me Jesus. When the headwinds of life are prevailing, always remember that Jesus is there with you. He longs for you to recognize his presence and his prevailing power and his ability to get you where he has sent you. After Jesus spoke to the disciples in verse 50 and in 51, he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. Jesus hasn't bailed on you. He hasn't callously told you to figure it out for yourself. He is saying to you right now, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Don't resist him when you should welcome him. He has climbed in the boat with you in that wind and ain't got no power to defy him. Time is slipping away and there is much, much more that we haven't had time to talk about in this passage. We didn't even make a big deal about Jesus walking on the water in the midst of a storm. Man, you should be able to spend all day there when you just think about that. How miraculous is that? But one last thought that I want to leave you with. The miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 took place immediately before Jesus compelled the disciples into the boat. What a miracle. If I could just see a miracle like that, I'd never have trouble recognizing Jesus again. That should have stirred faith and understanding in their heart concerning exactly who Jesus is. But the end of verse 51 and 52 says, they were completely amazed. One, that Jesus was on the scene walking on the water because they thought it was the boogeyman. Two, that when he got on the boat, the storm had subsided. Why? Verse 52. They had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. They had seen enough to know better and to have concluded more about who the Messiah was that they were following. But it was as if a thick skin or callus covered their understanding. The word hardened Puroa brings to mind the elephant's foot. Heavy layers of very thick and tough skin prevent any kind of dexterity or feeling. You and I have seen enough to know better of our Jesus. We ought not need to see him physically get in the boat. We ought not need to be surprised when our struggles are just a means for us to get to the other side with Jesus prevailing on our behalf. We shouldn't be amazed when the journey is difficult but successful. We shouldn't be amazed when Jesus shows up on the scene that the wind ceases. We shouldn't be amazed that the God who has done miracle after miracle after miracle in our lives is ready to do another miracle for us today and tomorrow and carry us through into that time when we step out of this world into the next. We shouldn't be amazed when the power of God manifests and demons are cast out. We shouldn't be amazed when sick people are made well. We shouldn't be amazed when the power of God does what's impossible. We should know Jesus and we should understand his ability. We should recognize Jesus whatever the storm is blowing around our lives. We need to get our focus off of the wind and waves and get our eyes upon Jesus, knowing that he is the author and the finisher of our faith and that he is working to get us to the place that he's told us to get to. Will there be struggle? Yes. Will there be hardship along their way? Will there be testing and trials? Yes, 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 and yes. If someone told you get saved, and you'd never face another difficult thing in life, 
If that was the only thing that drew you to the altar, you need to get saved today on the fact that Jesus is more than enough for your life, that you are a sinner lost in sin, that you are wicked and depraved, and only confessing your sin before Jesus and believing that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that he went to Calvary on your behalf to bring your sins, your condemnation to the cross, suffer in the grave on the third day, raised to life, defeating the power of your sin, and satisfying the wages of your sin, the debt that you owe God the Father. If anything other than that has been your salvation, I want you to know you need to get saved today. That's why you can't recognize Jesus in the midst of the headwind. That's why when the going gets tough, you get going the other direction. That's why you don't know that God will never leave you or forsake you. That's why fear rises up inside of you and you're out of your mind because you're trusting in what you can do, what you can strengthen the oars yourself. But if you will trust in Jesus to get you to the other side, you will experience true life abundance. Those things that have attached themselves to your life, those very voices of the enemy, of the stranger that have been witnessing in your head day after day, week after week, year after year, decade after decade, telling you that you'll never be free, you'll never be truly alive, that you'll never be enough, that you'll never this, that, or the other thing, that you'll never make any progress. Those are the voice of the enemy. Jesus will silence those things if you're able to see him for who he is. The I am that I am. The almighty, powerful God that created heaven and earth by his mere desire for it to be so says, do not fear, it is I. Do not fear, it is I. And I want you to know better than in the boat, if you're born again, he's in your heart. He is with you today. He is with you today. Yes, we have emotions. Yes, we have feelings. Yes, during the hard times, times when people betray us, we may feel hurt, we may feel pain. But know something, Jesus is working to bring you through. He will never leave you, never forsake you. Get going with Get going with God. He is more than enough. He is more than enough. Trust him this morning with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. Trust him this morning. He never will fail you.